Next, now we're going to talk about project scope management, chapter five in the PMBOK guide. Now the scope is the work that we're planning to accomplish on the project. Before I get started, let me mention that if you're interested, we have lots of free PMP prep materials at projectprep.org. Got cheat sheets, full-length practice tests, note cards, lots of stuff that should be pretty helpful. Now as we scope the project, um, something that, that is important to know here is that we should not only talk about what we plan to do, but what we're not going to do. We want to distinguish between those. And so we it's actually important to note both things as we scope the project. So there's six processes in this knowledge area. In planning, we're going to plan scope management, collect requirements, define scope, and create the WBS. And then in monitoring and controlling, we're going to validate and control the scope. So let me talk about those in detail. So with plan scope management, we're documenting how scope will be defined and controlled, how we're going to define our scope and gather our requirements. And then in collect requirements, we're documenting our stakeholder needs, trying to figure out what they want. And then we're going to define scope, developing a detailed project and product description. That's uh, sometimes just a, a few paragraphs, just a detailed description of what we plan to accomplish. And then we're going to take that scope and break it down, decompose that project work into smaller components to make it easier to manage. That's creating the WBS. We'll talk about what a WBS is in a bit. And then later, as we monitor the project, we're going to validate the scope, formalize acceptance of completed deliverables, and then we're going to control the scope, monitor it, and manage changes to the baseline. We validate it to get acceptance, and we control it to monitor the scope and manage changes to it. Uh, to kind of start talking about requirements and scope, I wanted to first talk about a personal experience. So in a previous home that I lived in, I contacted a landscaper to get feedback or an estimate for how much it was going to cost to landscape my front and my backyard. And so we came out, you know, um, did some drawings, and he sent me over an estimate. And he said to do everything, basically, it was going to cost me about $27,000. There was a long list of things that uh, we were interested in doing. And so these are actually drawings that he put together. This is my backyard and uh, the trees he was going to plant, as well as um, there's kind of was a patio out back, and he wanted to um, put a grill and a stone table next to it. And then there were some things in the front yard he wanted to do as well. But to get all of it done, it was going to cost $27,000. Now, I wanted all of it, really. It was a requirements or needs that I had, but I couldn't get everything done. So I had all of these requirements, but I had to scope the work smaller because of budget constraints. So requirements are really what the customer wants, and scope is what the project will actually deliver. Scope may not include all of requirements because of constraints we have of um, cost and schedule. So think about all the requirements coming in and the scope coming out. We're developing a detailed description of it and decomposing it or breaking it down to make it easier to manage. Now as we plan scope management, the two outputs we're going to have are the requirements management plan, documenting how we're going to collect and manage requirements from stakeholders, and then the scope management plan, documenting how the scope will be uh, defined and managed. Both of those are going to be in the project management plan, and we know that because they include the word plan at the end. Now let's talk about collecting requirements from customers or stakeholders. So this is determining, documenting, and managing stakeholder needs. The project success is directly influenced by stakeholders' involvement in this process. As we plan the project, they got to be really involved in the uh, defining of requirements. And we want to make sure they're clear and that um, we all agree upon them. And they can't be misinterpreted later down the road. If we have them directly involved and heavily involved here, it's going to you know, be a major indicator of success later. So imagine these requirements. Maybe I have this cup I'd like to create, and I want to add a handle to it. Add a lid with a small opening, add a straw, fill it with Dr. Pepper, put a picture of Grumpy Cat on the side, and so on. Maybe I wanted to do all of these things. Now the question I might ask is, these are all my requirements, but what can I get accomplished for $5? So what would the scope be on a $5 project? Maybe it's just the first four items. We're taking those requirements, collecting them, and then we got to determine our scope, define our scope. 
Now, as we gather requirements and collect them, we generate requirements documentation when just describing how requirements meet the business need. And requirements may start as a summary and get more detailed over time, but they must be clear, traceable, and acceptable to key stakeholders. Everybody really needs to understand um, what they are. And they should be written. They've got to be in a written format. Now let's talk about some techniques for collecting requirements. These are just some of them. We might interview customers, sit down with them and talk about what they need. We might observe the customers. We watch them in their environment to learn about uh, changes that we might want to make to our product or our project. We might use a nominal group technique. It's kind of a group brainstorming technique. Document analysis, looking at um, different documentation to learn about customers or stakeholders' wants and needs. Context diagrams, surveys, focus groups with experts, benchmarking, so comparing ourselves to other organizations or other teams or, or whatever to gather requirements. We might use facilitation techniques, meeting with some of our key stakeholders, and prototypes. These are all potential techniques for collecting requirements. And on this next slide, it's going to give you kind of just a description of each of them. Um, what I suggest is that you maybe pause this at some point and kind of focus in on the ones that don't make sense or that you're not familiar with. Let me just talk about a couple of these techniques, those observations. It's really talking to customers in their environment. For example, if we build lawnmowers or if we're designing a new lawnmower, we ought to watch customers mowing their lawn and try to understand some of the challenges or pain points they face. Now, as we collect requirements, we're going to generate requirements documentation. There's a few different components of those or different types of requirements. We might have business requirements, stakeholder requirements, solution requirements, project and transition requirements. So business requirements are those things that are the guiding principles of the organization, the requirements of the business. Then there are stakeholder requirements. Just we could have requirements submitted from any stakeholder. doesn't mean we're going to um, you know, include all that in the scope, but it's there. Then solution requirements. Uh, technology requirements, training requirements, quality requirements, they're really oftentimes product related. And then project requirements, not product requirements, project requirements, levels of service, performance, safety, compliance, um, certain project related um, things that we need to do. And then transition requirements. Once we're done with the project, there may, may be some requirements for how we transition it to some support team or to the customer, or the sponsor, whomever. How are we going to hand off the work that we've completed? Those are transition requirements. That could also include assumptions, dependencies, and constraints. Another output of the collect requirements process is the requirements traceability matrix. Now what this is going to do is link requirements to deliverables that satisfy them and ensures that each requirement adds value. So it's tracing back requirements to the business need. That's going to be important. There's got to be a business reason for why we're doing these things. We want to make sure the requirements actually trace back to that. So after we collect requirements and we define the scope, we're going to create something called the work breakdown structure, the WBS. So this is taking our scope and decomposing it into smaller components. And the reason why we do this is to make it easier to manage uh, down the road. And the lowest level of work in a WBS, and it's often, the WBS I should say, is often represented in a hierarchy, whether in a visual like you see on the right or just, you know, indentation in a, um, in a Microsoft project file or an Excel file. The lowest level of work in a work breakdown structure is called the work package. And the work package or work is the result of an activity and not the activity itself. I like to think of work as like a noun. And um, we're going to talk about you know, what's underneath that. But in the WBS itself, the lowest level is called the work package. Here's an example, and I think we'll give this in a second. But on a house, work packages might be the roof, the flooring, the foundation, uh, the walls, the plumbing, the electrical, and so on. They're packages of work. They're results of an activity. Here's an example hierarchy in our project. And this is just an example. There could be kind of additional layers in between these. But you obviously have the project at the top and then different deliverables and then work packages. And in the work breakdown structure, the work package is the lowest level. And then in the next chapter, we're going to talk about activities. Now, work packages 
are often nouns, as we talked about, like a phone. It's a work package you're creating maybe on a particular project. And activities oftentimes start with verbs. We design the phone, order the parts, assemble it, test it, and so on. Right now, though, in the work package, or in the WBS, we're just talking about work packages. We'll break it out into activities later. So let's use an example of building a house. Um, let's create a WBS for that. We're going to decompose the work by deliverable. There's a couple of different ways we could do this. Let's start with breaking the work down by deliverables, though. So uh, different deliverables could be for a home, the foundation, the walls, the plumbing, the roof, and the landscaping. We could also break it down by phase, planning, design, construction, inspection, finishing. Both are acceptable ways of breaking down the work on a project, and it's kind of up to you to determine what would be best. Now, a key output of the Create WBS process is the scope baseline. And let me talk about what a baseline is first. It's really a starting point used for comparisons. It's an approved version or approved plan. And a baseline, what we're going to do is compare that against an actual. And so we're comparing against what we agreed we would do against what actually happened. And I like to think of like going to a fast food restaurant. Oftentimes you see pictures of hamburgers at a fast food restaurant looking delicious. But then when you actually get the hamburger, the question is, what does it actually look like? So the baseline is what the plan for the hamburger was. And the actual is what actually got delivered to you. It may look very different. It may not look as delicious as it does in the advertisements. We're comparing our baseline against what actually happened. Okay, now let's talk about the scope baseline, the, the components of it. Uh, since you, we now want to know what a baseline is. So remember, the scope baseline is the key output of the Create WBS process. So it's going to include three things. The scope statement, the WBS, the work breakdown structure, and the work or the WBS dictionary. Really what the WBS dictionary is, is just kind of a description of the items or work packages in the WBS. And then we're going to put our scope baseline under change control. And it's going to be part of the project management plan. So if you recall, the project management plan is going to include things that end in both plan and baseline. And here's just a breakdown of the different components of the scope baseline. You've got your project scope statement, which is a description of the project scope, major deliverables, assumptions, and constraints. Then you have your WBS, the decomposition of the total scope of work to be carried out by the team. So you're taking your scope and decomposing it. That's the work breakdown structure. Then you've got a WBS dictionary, detailed information about WBS components. It's kind of just describing different work packages in the WBS. And what's important here is in what PMI wants you to know is that in the WBS dictionary, it's typically going to have a code of account identifier describing different things in the WBS, different work packages. And the reason why we give them a code is so in the future we can tie costs to them. So we can track our costs by the work package. And it also will include acceptance criteria. We've got these work packages in our WBS, and we need to understand and articulate what's acceptable, like what the customer is expecting for that work package. And then we're also in, in this uh, knowledge area going to be validating scope. Validating scope. And let me explain that a little bit. I've showed this diagram before, which is showing you the flow of deliverables. At this point, uh, validating scope is the third process in this picture. We're going to take deliverables that we've checked for quality as a team to check to see if they're correct. Gonna tr and then going to try to get acceptance from the customer. That's a validating the scope. And so verified deliverables or deliverables that we've checked for correctness are going to be an input to this process. And the output, hopefully, is going to be accepted deliverables. Deliverables accepted by the customer or sponsors as meeting their acceptance criteria. 